On the first day, we we spoke of an introduction to the noble truth, the Arya Satcha. Then on the following days, we discussed the Arya Satcha themselves. And today, being the last day, we will summarize or conclude the Arya Satcha. The Arya Satcha or the Arya Maga, whether the noble truths or the noble path, these must exist and lead to the destruction of enemies. If they don't, they don't lead to, if they don't exist for the purpose of getting rid of enemies, then we can't call them Arya. We can't really call them the noble truths or the noble path. If if it doesn't save us from our enemies, from all the various problems of life, then it's, it's useless, it's worthless. Even if something is a truth, if it doesn't help us to overcome all the problems of life, then it really has no, no meaning. It's just like a, a watch which doesn't keep the right time. To, to keep wearing a watch that never, never shows the right time would be a silly and worthless thing to do. It would just be hanging there for no purpose. And so the same with any truth that, that doesn't help us to solve our problems. If it doesn't overcome enemies, then we can't call it Arya, for it to be really Arya or noble. It must lead to the overcoming of all, all enemies. Earlier, last month, we, we spoke of Paticca Samupada, dependent origination. And then this month, we have discussed the Four Noble Truths, the Ariyasaja. It's essentially the same matter. The, this month, we've spoke of the, the Four Noble Truths in the condensed version. The Paticca Samupada is the Big Noble Truths, the complete and detailed version of the Four Noble Truths. It's the same thing, but in the standard outline of the Four Noble Truths, we have four, four meanings, four basic meanings. Whereas in Paticca Samupada, there's, there's twelve, twelve as to the arising of Dukkha, and 12 as to the quenching of dukkha, so it's 24. So it's much more detailed. However, it's the same thing. Just one is, one is the big one and the other's the small one, the small version. However, the Buddha also gave the Four Noble Truths in the form where there was only two matters two meanings, two issues, dukkha and the quenching of dukkha, dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. So we can even talk of the Four Noble Truths in, just, in terms of just these two things. The Buddha said that in the past, as well as at the, at the present, and it, this probably includes in the future as well. I speak only, I speak of only dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. 
These were the Buddha's words himself. In the form of Bhatichya Samupada, this is the, the most detailed, the most exquisite, the most complete version of the Ariyasacca. Then there is the standard of the Four Noble Truths, which is medium size. And then in this, this one, we have the, the most condensed and concise version of the Ariyasacca. In the past, as well as now, I set forth, I teach only dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. And so in studying the Ariyasacca, in practicing these, these truths, the important thing is to, to find the meaning, to discover for yourselves the meaning of dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. This is the essence, just these two things is the essence of the Noble Truths. Nowadays we, we tend to study the Ariyasacca with a lot of supplementary materials mixed in. There's a lot of extras, a lot of kind of environmental cultural materials that we mix in with the Four Noble Truths. And this makes our study of them very slow, awkward, sometimes confused and unsuccessful. For example, often, often we spend many years studying the Pali language, getting lost in all the intricacies and details of this, this language. Or many of the foreign scholars, they, they spend a lot of time studying Indian history or Indian philosophy, the various schools or whatever of that. So you see in a lot of the books on Buddhism that quite a bit of space is given to discussions of, of Indian history, Indian culture, even Indian geography, as well as Indian philosophy. All of these are supplementary materials which are really not essential for the study of the Ariyasaja. And then we even go and spend a lot of time studying the story of the Buddha's life, the personal details of, of this one particular human being. And this itself is, is merely a supplementary thing. It's not really the essence of the matter. The details of the Buddha's life isn't essential for our study. It's important that we, we get to the real meanings of the Ariyasacca, dukkha and the quenching of dukkha, that we, we get to this essential matter within our own, our own experience. And we should be careful about spending a lot of time on these supplementary matters which really don't help us in dealing with what is essential and important. And probably there are quite a few of you who are interested in studying about Buddhism in Burma, Buddhism in Sri Lanka, Buddhism in India, China, Japan, and so forth. There are quite a few who would like to know all about Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, and so on. People who are, quite a few people are willing to spend a lot of time studying these various superficial aspects, instead of which is, is not a very clear or direct study of the, of the, the noble truths. Instead, we need to just aim right for the, the noble truths and dive in, plunge right in to the Ariyasaja. These other things can be left aside. They can wait. The thing is to, 
get right to the heart of the Dhamma, to the heart of, of Buddhism, dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. In this way, if we, if we go right into the Ariyasaja, then we come much more quickly and easily to an understanding of Dhamma. And we, through that we have Dhamma, we see the Dhamma. And this is, in, in this way, we see everything that is important in Buddhism. The Buddha himself said that those who see the Dhamma see me. Those who see me see the Dhamma. If anyone wants to know about the Buddha, the way to meet the Buddha is to, to see the Dhamma. And this means to dive right into, to immerse oneself in the Ariyasaja. Please remember the words of the Buddha which we like to repeat quite frequently. He said that whether this whether dukkha or the cause of dukkha or the quenching of dukkha or the path leading to the quenching of dukkha I say that all of these can be found only in this this fathom long body which is still living the Buddha is saying the only place to, to discover the Four Noble Truths is in this, this living body, which is roughly a fathom long, five, six feet or so long. And let us mention specifically the system of mindfulness with breathing as an excellent way to discover the Four Noble Truths within this living body. Because in Anapanasati, we, we are only concerned with what's happening within this living body. And all of the Noble Truths can be understood thoroughly through Anapanasati. So we encourage you to, to pay close attention and be interested in the practice of mindfulness with breathing. In the, on a future occasion, we are going to discuss the anapanasati in the same detail which we have discussed dependent origination and the noble truths. The noble truths are the collection of all the necessary teachings. We have to emphasize the word necessary because there are quite a, men, a few teachings which are unnecessary. But in the Ariya Satcha we find all the necessary teachings gathered together. They all fit into the Four Noble Truths. This is very important. The Buddha himself once said that I have, awake of all the, I have awakened to many, many things. My knowledge is, is very vast and broad. He compared it to all the leaves in a forest was what the knowledge of a Buddha was like. But then he picked up a handful of leaves and said, but what I teach is only one fistful of leaves that fistful of leaves is the, the Four Noble Truths. Of all the knowledge of a Buddha, that which is necessary to teach for the benefit of other beings is just the Noble Truths. When, when we say that we should skip over the, the story of the Buddha's life, and go straight to the study of the, the Noble Truths that we should uncover and realize the Four Noble Truths within ourselves. This may sound like we don't give much importance to the Buddha, but one should remember what the Buddha himself said, which was, 
one who sees the Dhamma sees me. Whoever sees me sees the Dhamma. This shows that the, the essence, the real way to see the Buddha is in awakening to the Dhamma. One doesn't know, really know the Buddha from reading about his, his life, in the story of his life. The real Buddha is found within the, the penetration of Dhamma. Now, if one is going to, would like to read a bit about the Buddha's life, at least do so with an emphasis on dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. If we study the Buddha's life, we should be looking for knowledge about dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. But most of the books about the Buddha's life are quite extensive. And so some of them, they just treat the Buddha as a historical figure in ancient India. And so reading those versions of the Buddha's life is pretty much just like reading Indian history. Or others' versions are full of legends and mythological type things. And so there are many of the books on the Buddha's life aren't so useful in terms of Dhamma. And so if we, we should be very careful to, to emphasize, to stick to what is important and essential, Dukkha and the quenching of Dukkha. Further, we ought to understand that the noble truths are for anyone any human being that is suffering dukkha. Any human being that is going through dukkha needs the noble truths, must study the Ariyasacca. There are some, some scholars and some philosophers both in Thailand and around the world who have the mistaken idea that the Ariyasacca are for the the ones who already are awakened, the so-called enlightened beings, that it's, it's not for ordinary people. It's just for those who want to, to leave home and live like a, a monk or a nun, and for those who are already awakened. This is quite a sad misunderstanding because anyone, or what these people think is that if ordinary people, if businessmen and the such are concerned with the Four Noble Truths, they won't, they won't develop, they won't progress in their business or whatever. And this is foolishness. If one, if one is aware of dukkha in one's life, for any human being where there is dukkha, it is necessary to, to study and practice the Noble Truths. <clears throat> Otherwise, that life will be stuck in Dukkha and it won't go anywhere. If the farmers, even the poorest farmers, know and understand the Noble Truths, then they'll have much less Dukkha than they have now. If the laborers, understand the Noble Truths, they'll have quite a bit less dukkha than they have now. Even the businessmen who have all kinds of projects and activities going are quite busy and are, have quite a bit of dukkha. If they understand the Noble Truths, then there will be much less dukkha in their lives and then there won't be any need for them to, to commit suicide, as so often happens. Then they can lessen craving and then increase right aspiration. And then in doing so, their life is much more successful and there is much less dukkha. This is very beneficial 
for any human being. Any life that has, has problems, has any problem, needs the, the noble truths. The problems of life is something we, we, need an under, we need an explain to you. We all know what, these, what it is to have burdens in life, to have to go through many difficulties and hassles, to have all the struggle and trouble that, is, that, makes, up, that makes up life. We understand that it's not difficult to see the lack of rest in in a life that has problems. If one has these problems and sees the need to, to rest, then it's through the Four Noble Truths that one can find that, that rest, the rest from all the struggle, all the problems and hassles. So any life that has any problems, any trouble, is in need of the Noble Truths. We'd like to ask you all, could you run away from a dangerous tiger without any fear? If you are confronted in the woods by a tiger, a lion, a bear, or some other large animal, could you run away without any fear? Most of us, if we run from fear, we, we don't run very carefully. And so we can make mistakes and errors, and we may not be able to escape properly. But if there's no craving, no dukkha, if the mind is clear and free, then one can run away in the most artful and skillful way. One will have the best chance of escape. Are, are you able to run away from a tiger without any fear? The world is full of dangers and so then we ask, can one, can, can one deal with these dangers? Can one face these dangers of the world without any fear? They're not only the dangers like wild animals, tigers, lions, and bears. But there are many dangers in, of, of travel and in the big cities. And then there are all the diseases and, el and illnesses that people are so afraid of these days. These we can all call worldly dangers. Is one able to face these things, to deal with them, cope with them, without any fear. Fear comes from craving. If one understands the four noble, the noble truths, then there's no craving and no fear. And then one can deal with even the worst disease or the biggest calamity, the most powerful danger, without any fear. The more the world develops materially and the less it develops in Dhamma, then the more the world is full of dangers, the more there's material development without Dhamma development, the more, the more vast and numerous are the dangers in the world. So to live in a world that is increasingly full of, of dangers in very many different ways. One must have the adhyasaja as a way to cope with it all, to not get lost and chewed up by all the dangers. It's very important that one has these truths which are adhya, which are enemyless, the truths that, that free us, that allow us to escape from all enemies. This is the only way to, and so we must try to bring into this world 
this increasingly more dangerous world, we must try to bring in these noble truths for the benefit of humanity. So for all of us who must live in this world that keeps developing materially, we need the noble truths to live without any problems. As the world continues to develop in material ways, it becomes more and more difficult to cope with. It's a more difficult world to live in. By the, but with the noble truths, we can live in such a world without any problems. So please study and practice the noble truths so that you can cope with this more difficult world, so that you can live in it without any troubles. I'd like you to recall that earlier we pointed out that the principle of the noble truths is a scientific principle. It's not philosophical and it's not merely logic. Many people continue to overlook this point. They try to treat the noble truths as philosophy, as some product of human thought. They don't understand that it's scientific and so, so they miss out on its benefits. As material science continues to develop and, prove, and, and invent more and more fantastic material things, all these material products of technology and material science serve to, to support and increase our craving. They, they lure us and trick us more and more into craving. So it's necessary to have a spiritual science as well, to use spiritual science to understand what's happening and use that spiritual science to to solve the problem and not get caught up in all that craving. The only remedy for all the material science or the antidote for the material science is spiritual science. You may have heard already or read the words of Albert Einstein that in the future the religion that will remain in this world will be the religion that can cope with the needs and the means of modern science. The only religion that can will be appropriate in the modern world will be the one that can, can cope with the, the means, the needs, the systems, the methods of modern science. So please study, please investigate the noble truths in a scientific way. Study them sufficiently and then you'll be able to, to survive and even thrive in a world of, of manifold complexity and confusion brought on by our, our out of control material development. The beggar with no money and very difficult living conditions must rely upon the noble truths to deal with that situation of theirs, to live without problems and suffering. Or the person who is ill, one who has caught a dangerous disease, must rely upon the noble truths so that their condition, their situation, won't be full of dukkha. And even the person who is going to die, who has contracted some illness or disease that, and the doctor says there's no cure, for someone to cope with such a situation, they must depend upon the noble truths in order to, 
to live out their life, what little remains of it, without a lot of torment and pain. One must depend upon the truth that about lessening attachment to the body and mind, that one must, that if one lessens craving, if one eliminates craving, that then there is no suffering. So even, even beggars and sick people must study and depend upon the noble truth. Or on the other extreme, to take a millionaire, someone with loads of money and wealth, or a powerful politician, successful politician who has accumulated much power. Either of these cases, if they are to, would, either of these cases must rely upon the Four Noble Truths if they are to avoid turning their, their wealth and money or their power into a burden. If they're to live without being burdened by their wealth and power, they must understand the Noble Truths and use them. Or even if they are, are devas, celestial beings up in, up in heaven, which is something you all know, you know plenty about. Even if one is a deva up in heaven, if that, that situation of living in paradise is not going to be a burden and a hassle, then one must know the noble truths. These, these truths are so fundamental that they're necessary even for celestial beings. In, in paradise. And so we can even say that with laborers and the wealthy capitalists, the Four Noble Truths are equally necessary. For the one to deal with their, their poverty and the harsh conditions of their life, or for the capitalists to deal with their wealth, if they are to avoid turning their poverty and wealth into, situ into problems and dukkha, the noble truths are necessary. Or we say that both for human beings and for celestial beings, the heavenly beings, the noble truths are equally necessary. It says in the scriptures how the Dhamma, is for both the heavenly beings and the human beings. And so this is why we say that the Dhamma, the Noble Truths, are of great importance for both the workers and the owners, the laborers and the capitalists. In India, they explain some of these words in the following way, that that a human being is a being that knows all about sweat and perspiration. That means a human being is one who must work and work hard in order to survive. And in that work there is always sweat. One who lives by sweat is a human being. Whereas a celestial being is one who has no contact no knowledge, no experience of, of sweat. They live in a, a comfortable, easy way. And so there's no, no perspiration. So this is how these words can be understood. The human being lives by sweat and the celestial being lives without sweat. And then to go along with that is the, something rather amusing that as soon as a, an angel or a heavenly being comes into contact with sweat, then they have to die. As soon as a heavenly being sweats, they die immediately. The noble, the noble path, the noble eightfold path is the Adiyamaka, 
is the knowledge, the understanding that is most important and necessary for for all these different beings, whether the, the beggars and the very poor, or those who are ill, as well as the laborers, and then ordinary people, all the way on to the the devas, those who never sweat. All for all of them, the noble truths are are necessary for the the Eightfold Path is the way to deal with and solve all their problems and be free of dukkha. So the Arya Sajja are necessary for any being that experiences dukkha. From the lowest level to the highest, any being that, that knows experiences dukkha needs the, the noble truths. This is why we keep emphasizing their importance. Any being, no matter what their condition, if there is dukkha, the, an- the only answer is the noble truth. Next, we'd like to talk about refuge. Refuge is the place where we can go for security and safety. In Buddhism, it's traditional to speak about going to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha for refuge. But the Buddha himself said that one, one can find no refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha without the Noble Truth. It's through the Adiyasaja that one is able to actually take the Buddha, the Dhamma, and Sangha as refuge. Or it's the same for those who would seek refuge in God. <clears throat> Without the Noble Truths, we can never find any true refuge with God. One needs the Noble Truths if God is to be our refuge, just as with the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Another funny thing is the Buddha said to rely on oneself, to take oneself as refuge. This means to take the Dhamma within oneself as refuge to know the Noble Truths. This is what the Buddha said, but most of the followers, most of the the so-called Buddhists, don't even listen to the Buddha. They're rather pig-headed and don't even pay attention. So when he said, instead of taking the themselves as refuge, most people want to take the Buddha as refuge. But the Buddha himself said, take your, be your own refuge find refuge in the Dhamma, in the understanding and practice of the Noble Truths. The words rely on oneself and rely on Dhamma are interchangeable. They have their synonyms having the same meaning. The only way to, because to rely on oneself is to rely on one's own understanding of the Noble Truths. We've said many times also that Dhamma has the same meaning as God. And so to rely on God, to depend on God, means once again to to depend upon one's own understanding of the Ariya Satcha. So whatever it is we'd like to depend on, ultimately the only way to do it is by relying on oneself, by relying on the Dhamma of the Noble Truths. This point about Dhamma in God having the same value and meaning is something that we should used to clear up a lot of the misunderstanding amongst religions, especially between those religions that have a God and those that don't. If we can see this connection between Dhamma and God, then there won't be any more need for the argument, competition, and all the the hassles and confusion going on between religions. If we can see this connection, 
then it's no difficulty for everyone to rely upon the noble truth and then everyone can be free of dukkha have a, live life without suffering is relying upon the noble truths scientific or not look at this and see is it scientific to depend upon the noble truths and then to depend on someone else something external to us is this scientific or not we live in a scientific era in an age that's dominated by science the scientific attitude if we're to live in this is it necessary to have a refuge which fits with science that is appropriate to the scientific understanding of our times please look carefully and see what if something is going to be a genuine refuge for us must it be scientific or or not the buddha said that for one who has realized the noble truths one who has merely realized them thoroughly understood them although not hasn't yet practiced them just to know them is enough that for that person dukkha will remain there will be only a little bit of dukkha left he compared it to a piece of dust on the tip of one's fingernail that's how much dukkha is left compared to the himalayan mountains which is how much dukkha there was before and so by knowing even if we're not having practiced it yet but just by thoroughly knowing realizing the noble truths there's only a little itty bit of dukkha left and then with both understanding and practice there's no dukkha left at all so this is the tremendous value of the noble truths if one understands them knows them then dukkha is almost gone and then by knowing and practicing then dukkha disappears completely so it's important for us to study these noble truths until we realize them thoroughly not just to listen to talks read books and think about it but to work on this very deeply in the mind until it is it is a direct experience till we know directly for ourselves <clears throat> what dukkha is like and we see that craving is the cause of dukkha and that by ending craving dukkha quenches and that the noble eightfold path is the way to remove that craving and quench dukkha in another place the buddha compared the value of the noble truths in the following way he said he said that someone who sincerely wanted to realize the noble truths would willingly allow some would put up with would endure being beaten and and stabbed with sharp instruments all day long for a hundred years if that would lead to a penetration of the noble truths it's so valuable that one would withstand all that physical punishment if that would be the cause of realizing the noble truths or that one would one would be willing to travel great distances would go on the most distant and powerful and dangerous journey if it would be the cause of of realizing the noble truths the value of these truths are so great that one would be willing to put that much into it 
would withstand any hardship or danger or difficulty that if they were the cause of realizing these truths. For us nowadays, it isn't necessary for us to be, to go through all that much difficulty, all being beaten or going on tremendous journeys. It's enough for us to to put up with the small difficulties and hassles of practicing mindfulness with breathing. Doing so isn't near as difficult as expressed in these, these comparisons of the Buddha. We just need to be willing to put forth the patience and the effort to practice anapanasati successfully. And that will lead to <clears throat> an understanding of the Four <clears throat> Noble Truths. And so, that one is, we've, those of you who come from America, Europe, Australia, or wherever, coming here hasn't been such a difficult journey. You, we haven't had to go through all that many hardships. So all one needs to do is carry on now with practicing anapanasati as, as we've begun. And that will lead to the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Next, we'd like to talk about our, our a debt or the debt of gratitude. We, the person we are most indebted to in our life those who we are most indebted to are those who help us to understand the noble truth. We should, when we see that which is valuable in our lives, which of, that which is of the highest value, then we naturally feel indebted to that person who has helped us to achieve this this very valuable thing. And the most valuable thing we can find in life is the Four Noble Truths. Anyone who helps us to understand them is someone who we are indebted to. Whatever we might call them, the person who has done the most good for us the one who has given us the most, who has done us the most benefit, whoever has helped us the most, done what is most valuable for our lives. That would be the person who helps us to know the noble truths, who leads us to know the noble truths. This is given much more value than even our parents, our friends, our lovers, our spouses, the one who helps us to see the noble truth is the most valuable friend or acquaintance we can find. So, we should be very interested in this, this person. In one place, the Buddha says that Whoever takes me as their friend, whoever has me as their friend, as their, as their good and noble friend, that per, the one who is ordinarily troubled and has problems with birth, age, illness, and death, that one will escape from, will be free from birth, age, illness, and death. Anyone who's having troubles with birth, age, illness, and death by taking the Buddha as one's good friend, as one's Galayanamita, will, will be freed, will escape from those troubles and problems of birth, aging, illness, and death. And having the Buddha as one's friend means, means having the Four Noble Truths. For as long as we fail to understand the Noble Truth, 
then we will see that sawtooth discs we will see sawtooth discs as lotuses this is a thai proverb hen gong jak ben dog bua a gong jak is a a disc like a discus that has a very sharp edges toothed edges like on a saw blade this was an ancient weapon that could be thrown and it would spin and it could just cut things off very quickly so it's a as long as we don't understand we don't realize the four noble truths we'll see this very dangerous saw spinning saw tooth disc as being a lotus as being beautiful <coughs> if one doesn't see the noble truth one takes dangerous and harmful things to be beautiful and then one <coughs> grabs on to them and suffers greatly by doing so let us throw in a little bit of interesting information here the archaeologists working in drang province which isn't that far from here just a few hours by train have found a a large disc with very sharp edges and a handle that could be grasped and it, so it seems that this sawtooth disc is actually is an actual weapon that was used in ancient times or maybe even prehistoric times they don't know how old it is but this this proverb we that we've mentioned actually comes from a very ancient weapon used a long time ago as long as we don't know the noble truths when we look see it when we look at an enemy we won't see them as an enemy but through the noble truths we'll know our enemies for being enemies and then we can end the enemies we can be finished with all enemies what this proverb means is that we we tend to like dukkha we fall in love with dukkha we go crazy about dukkha we firmly establish and stick ourselves in the midst of dukkha how how silly in lunatic is that to do so this is the the meaning of this proverb which is to say seeing seeing the sawtooth disc as a as a lotus means that what we do in life is we take bait we search for bait in order to to satiate in order to satiate craving we find bait in order to entice and feed craving this is what we do rather than merely finding food in order to nourish and maintain life we don't just do the duty of nourishing life with food instead we look for bait in order to entice and then feed craving so please don't confuse bait with food don't mix up this bait with actual nourishing nutritious food if we don't know the noble truths we'll spend our whole life searching for bait constantly looking for bait but by knowing the ariya sat the riya satcha then we understand what is truly food and we can use that food to nourish and sustain life please don't confuse these two otherwise our life will be a mess this is yet another example of how the ariya satcha can help us help us who live in the world can help us can help the entire world because by knowing the difference between food and bait we could actually bring about peace in this in this troubled and violent world there's no peace because 
nobody can see the difference between food and bait. And so there's all the various kinds of struggling and fighting. In this modern civilization of ours, what we've got most of all is, is constantly searching for bait in order to entice craving and feed craving. Look at all the advertisements that they've got. Look at the things they advertise in the newspapers and the magazines. It's just a bunch of stuff that we really don't need. Most of the things they're selling in the stores is stuff we don't even need. If you open any magazine, it's full of advertisements for whiskey, cigarettes, fancy hotels, movies. Almost all of it is stuff we don't even need. If we didn't have any of this stuff, there's, there's no danger of dying just because we didn't have these things. This is the kind of situation we've got. Constantly stirring up our craving, feeding the craving. Not, not merely wisely finding the food we need in order to live, but always going off on this, this other stuff which is not at all necessary. And as we, we go about continually stirring up craving and satisfying craving, feeding craving, then there arises upadana, attachment to things as I and mine. And then there's the ego is born and selfishness. So this way of living with craving means living in a very selfish way, constantly stirring up selfishness. And with all this selfishness, we're constantly plunging the world into all kinds of crises. So we must live with these terribly frightening crises that are created by our, our own selfishness. This is the result of not understanding the noble truths. And so finally, we can say that all Dhamma, all of Dhamma in Buddhism is contained within the Ariya Satcha. That means to know the Ariya Satcha, the noble truths, is to know all of Buddhism. As the Buddha said, the Dhamma that we need to know that is important is like one single fistful of leaves. And that fistful is the Ariya Satcha. All the Dhamma of Buddhism is found within this one fistful of leaves. So we ought to study the Four Noble, the noble Truths and practice carefully according to them until understanding them thoroughly and having them firmly within our, within our hearts. So we, we encourage you to listen carefully, to think about this carefully, and then to build, build yourself the tool of mindfulness with breathing. Make for yourself this very exquisite tool of anapanasati, that will give you a very special way to know the noble truths. This is the, the end of our, our topic because it all ends by knowing the four noble, excuse me, by knowing the noble truths. If one realizes the noble truths, that is the end of the work. And then all the problems, all dukkha, are quenched. So please do whatever you must do to realize these, the noble truths, the Ariya Satcha, and have a life that is free of, of all dukkha. So this is the end of our discussion of the noble truths. These are the truths that are more beneficial and of more value than anything else in the world. This is all that Buddhism has to offer, this Dhamma of the Ariya Satcha, the truths 
that make us free of all enemies. Or to try and translate this with the fewest words, the truths that free us from enemies, or we could say enemyless truths, or the truths of enemylessness. That's the end of today's meeting.